Chiswick House, by the end of the 18th century, so, so by the time Austin was sort of a grown up, um, was owned by the Dukes of Devonshire. Um, and one of Austin's brothers, her brother Henry, uh, she had six brothers, but Henry was probably one of her favourite ones. Um, and he acted, acted as her literary agent quite often. Um, he, he was a banker by then and he was quite closely connected in kind of business terms with, with the Devonshire family, with, with, the, with the Cavendishes. Um, so she certainly knew, knew of them and I think through that kind of knew, knew about Chiswick. And it was quite, you know, it was quite a cool place as well. It was, it was sort of a, a sort of happening social hub. It was on yeah. the social map, yes, wasn't it? Yes, yes, absolutely. She's going to be on the new £10 note, of course, but you're not very enthusiastic about that prospect. It's wonderful that she's going to be on there. Look, it's, it's great. Um, but um, the, uh, the, the, the two problems that a lot of people had with it, that I think, I think probably most Austin um, scholars had with it, was that the portrait that they're using is very much airbrushed. Um, it's, uh, it's based on a, um, uh, an engraving that was done for um, the frontispiece of a Victorian family memoir of her that was published in 1869 and then the second edition in 1870. Um, and it's a, very, it's a very kind of high Victorian idea of, of a, a kind of mild, mild spinster maiden authoress. Um, it's all, it's all softened, you know, her eyes are kind of wonderfully big and lustrous and she's wearing a particularly expensive cap and they've kind of made her shoulders all sort of fashionably sloping, which was uh, the kind of beauty norm at the time. Um, so she looks, she looks as if, you know, her family has a lot more money because they can afford for her to wear this, you know, the nice, the nice dress that you see, the nice hat, um, nice cap. And, um, and also she just looks generally sort of, you know, uh, very, very prettified, essentially. So most Austin scholars were a, bit, were a bit kind of up in arms about that and also about the choice of quotation um, as well. I declare, after all, there is no enjoyment like reading, um, which you may know is um, actually Caroline Bingley. So it's a sort of it's all very it's all very kind of heavily ironised. She's reading she's reading a book that um, Mr Darcy is reading the kind of first volume of. So she's reading it as a sort of means of flirting with him. She doesn't care about the book at all, and she throws it away you know, kind of two two lines further on. Um, so uh, there was a sort of oh, like oh they, they don't, don't really understand what they're doing they don't understand Austin they've done this kind of very pretty version of her and they've misread a wonderfully hilarious scene. Um, I had a, I, I suppose slightly uh, a slightly more thoroughgoing issue with it, which is that I really really hate what they've chosen to put in the background. That they've chosen to put in the background of the design on the on the Austin side. Um, is a picture of a, a lovely big house with a sort of little, you know, coach and horses driving up to it, like the beginning of a, of a BBC, you know, classic, classic book adaptation. Um, and the house, the house is connected to Austin. It's her brother Edward's um, estate, Godmersham in Kent. Um, but it gives her a kind of completely erroneous background putting that there. Edward was adopted by distant relatives, so his his way of living. The houses that he lived in, that's not that's not where Jane's coming from. That's that's not her background at all. I'm uh, very bemused as to why they didn't use a picture of, of the cottage at Chawton that she published all her novels from. Um, it, it's it, it just seems a sort of really really quite odd odd idea, and it's very the effect of the note overall is a very a very kind of confining, very constrained idea of what, what Austen is and what she's writing. So your book, in fact, The Secret Radical, explains just how subversive her writing was. Uh, yes, I explore the, um, uh, I, I suppose, the kind of complications in the novel, so the kind of darker side um, of the stories that she tells um, by, um, by kind of setting, um, setting up the historical context. When the novels were written, and the sort of um, the the kind of connections and ideas that might have been running through the heads of readers at, at the time, the first the first readers of the novel, as opposed to us, kind of two hundred years. Further. She explains the position of women in those times, doesn't she? That men uh, had all the power, and women weren't left money uh, and weren't allowed really to have money of their own. Well, I mean, they they, they could be, but um, the reason that you tended not to do it was because, uh, unless you were extremely careful, kind of involved lots and lots of lawyers beforehand, um, what they couldn't do was own money when they were married. So they legally 
were non-existent. Um, it's a, a, a legal doctrine called coverture, uh, and that meant that the moment you got married, you legally ceased to exist. So you were you were no longer there. Um, you were part of your husband. You were kind of legally absorbed into him. Your husband could leave guardianship of your children away from you. You were not your child's legal guardian. Um, you couldn't, um, again, unless it had been tied up, you couldn't do anything with your property. Your property was your husband's. You were, you were part of your husband, and so everything you had was your husband's property to do with as, as he wished. And that caused huge problems for women at the time. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I mean, it's, I mean marry, married women, the, the money that they earned wasn't even theirs. Like, the husband could, could come along and, and take it. There's a um, horrible story, actually, about a, um, a, a novelist that Austen really liked called Charlotte Smith. Um, and um, she had, she got to the point. She had a, she had a, an unpleasant, abusive husband who she did separate from. But he used to kind of periodically turn up and like take her money away from her that she'd been been earning by by writing. And she had to sort of, she had to enter into an arrangement with her publishers where they doled her out her money in kind of small bits, so he couldn't he couldn't come and just uh, take off with it. What happens at the beginning of Sense of Sensibility is that you know the the Dashwood girls, so Eleanor and Marianne and the poor forgotten Margaret. Um, end up with next to nothing. So they get disinherited, they get just swept off the family tree, um, essentially, and kind of tied it away into a corner because they are, they're not necessary for the continuation of, of the Dashwood family. Um, and yeah, I think, I think Austen kind of feels quite... Um, she, she can see the injustice of it. Um, certainly Sense of Sensibility is, is a novel which appears very deliberately to be exploring, you know, what what the what the legal ramifications of of that that kind of property ownership nexus are for women she's not very complimentary about the clergy either she uh, shows really she's how morally bankrupt. extremely critical of the clergy and i mean she's not not alone for, for this in in the period but um you you do get you do get a surprising number of of critics sort of insisting oh she's she's the daughter of a clergyman she, she was the daughter of a clergyman and the granddaughter of a clergyman and Godfather was clergyman, and all her brothers were clergymen, um, and for 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 some critics, for a certain kind of school of critics, um, they're completely convinced that this means that Austen could never be critical of the clergy at all. But then you think of Mr. Collins, for example, and not just Mr. Collins, but actually all of them. You know, there's Mr. Elton in Emma. There's um, uh, even even the kind of you know Henry um, Henry Tilney and um, uh, and Edmund Bertram in Mansfield Park are, they're not, they're not terribly kind of upstanding moral figures.